You're listening to Titular Characters with your host, the adorable Eva Webb. Steve Ellis is a comic book artist and illustrator who has worked for Wizards of the Coast, DC Comics, Wildstorm, White Wolf, Moonstone Books, Marvel Comics, and others. Steve is the illustrator and co-creator behind The Silencers and High Moon. His work has been featured on CD covers computer games, trading cards, books, RPGs, toys, and comics, with his Comic Vine profile boasting 136 issues. But the best part is that he's here today to talk about his thoughts, insights, creative process, and philosophy around comics. How are you, Steve? I'm doing just fine. How about you? I am loving life. So I understand you've got a, an, an exciting new project uh, to talk about. What's going on with it? Oh, well, um, yeah, I've been working with, a, I don't know if it's necessarily new, but it's uh, the the series The Only Living Girl with David Gallagher uh, that that's uh, published by Paper Cuts. We're working on the, I guess right now it's the, the second issue is out, and I'm working on the fourth issue right now to get so the third issue can come out. So, <laughs> so we're we're in the process of working on that, um, and yeah. So like that's a continuation of the series, the only living boy. Well, a, a kind of a companion series to the series, the only living boy, which we started out with years ago. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm not that sure. Was- what- <laughs> yeah, that, it, it's fine. Only Living Boy was a ton of fun. Uh, that that was the one with uh, oh the costume design and it was beautiful and it had dragons and uh, um, it had uh, this 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 uh, one villain that was just really really uh, incredible. Oh, um, do- the the evil mad scientist Doctor Once. Doctor Once, that's the guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. He, he he doesn't really quite go away in this series. I mean. Awesome. I mean or I should say, Doctor Once is gone, but there, there's there's ramifications from him in the second in, in the Only Living Girl. Because what what's cool about the Only Living Girl is it's a it's kind of it's in a way on one hand a continuation of the Only Living Boy series, like the story, but it's from the point of view of a different character, and so it's like the same the same story moving forward from there, but switching point of view to uh to z who's a uh character who appears at the end of the only living boy and so it's 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 like basically we switched viewpoint to a new character neat that's a really uh interesting storytelling mechanism right there well yeah it was it was like when we first were coming up with the ideas we were talking about it being mostly it was going to be originally just a continuation of the only living boy and then we realized it would be more interesting to to see what we could do, like his, you know, it's like, it's like that character already went through an arc. So rather than make that character the main focus of a second arc, switch to another character so she can get her arc and then he can be a background character or a secondary character in that story. So it's kind of like getting our cake and eat it, eating it too. You know, we, we get to have, we get to keep our old character while bringing in a whole new character and viewpoint and kind of attitude towards the world around it. Nice. But uh, this isn't the first uh, comic you've worked on. You've worked on uh, all sorts of stuff. When I was going through your uh, your bibliography, my jaw dropped. You know, I have read a lot of these. I have a ton of them in my really? collection. Yeah. That's really funny. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I started out working at Marvel many, many, many years ago, um, and then uh, DC for like I, I kind of went back and forth between the two of them. Never quite found my my footing there, and then ended up doing uh, more independent projects that kind of really seemed to, you know, uh, work for me better. Um, like, uh, well, I started doing books with Fred Van Lente. Uh, back in the 90s, uh, one called Tranquility and then another called The Silencers. And then David Gallagher and I did High Moon and then then The Only Living Boy and Only Living Girl. So those have been the main comics I've been doing with, you know, some smattering of of uh, mainstream comics mixed in from there. Nice. Nice. That's pretty awesome. So um, where does your... Uh... Your love affair with comics began. How far back is it now? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Um, when I was, uh, wow, I'm going to say, I, I forget what year it was. Well, when I was in eighth grade, I guess, um, I knew that comics existed because I had like three of them. Um, and then I had a friend invite me along to go to the comic book store. And like apparently every Sunday, he and his friends would force one of their parents to drive them like 45 minutes out <laughs> to a uh, comic book store in a barn. And wow. uh, yeah, it, I mean, it wasn't really a barn. It was like an antique shop. Like it was like this gigantic barn that was like part antique shop, part comic book store, part like, you know, uh, I don't know what else, just junk store, I guess. And, um, and so they had a, uh, they, they, we would go out there, uh, on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning and, and basically, uh, you know, rifle through the boxes. And I had no idea what I was looking for or, or anything. I think one of the first comics I ever got was the A-Team, which is actually a little bit kind of, uh, what do you call it? Embarrassing. <laughs> Don't feel but, bad. Well, I mean, it's funny. Up until that point, I'd had like an Iron Man, a Thor, and a Batman comic that i don't even know how I got my hands on them, but I'd had them like since I was like a little, little kid. And I think I'd read them like 5,000 times by that point. I didn't even know you could buy comics at the po- at that point. Nice. Nice. I took my daughter to one of those recently. The, uh, the, out here in, uh, in St. Louis, there's, a, uh, there's an antique mall. And oh, yeah. right in the, the back, most dustiest corner of it, there's this <laughs> incredible comic book store. And... Uh, it was fun taking her in and just watching her eyes open wide up, you know. Well, I, I remember what was really cool. I guess I, I was kind of, I was there when, when I started buying comics myself. Like, literally, I think I picked up the A-Team and then like two months later, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles started coming out. Or maybe it was already coming out and I just like only found out about it then. But like, that's when like, uh, it was kind of neat because it was like that was the original run of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and it was kind of just like you know you kind of knew I kind of knew about Mar- you know the Marvel characters and the DC characters from all the TV shows I'd seen as a kid and all the other comics sitting around but like the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was a pretty big kind of door opener there and then I went back and found like Maybe I'm, I might be getting my timing wrong because I think I, I think I found I don't know, but anyway the the that was a big that was a that era like around Dark Knight and um, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was really where I think I started going oh hey you know comics could be really really cool you know like really not just you know the A Team comics or whatever and I remember that's when I discovered stuff like the New Mutants and. Uh, and then, you know, and, and I think the, the thing that I got, I fell in love with was all just the, the idea that comics could tell stories that they would, back then at least, that they wouldn't allow you to tell on TV. Because I remember thinking all the cartoons on TV were really kind of lame, but in the comics you could do pretty much anything, you know, like, you know, uh, Wolverine was not on TV at that point. There was no, like, you know, there were no... Uh, you know, the, the super friends was the most, um, aggressive superheroes out there. So like when you, when you picked up, when you picked up dark Knight returns, it was like, no one knows I'm reading this, do they? You know, cause like, it felt <laughs> kind of like, 
you could read some, you know, and no one did know, like, you know, so many people were so uh, against comics and selling you how, you know, how bad they were that when, or, you know, how, how like, you know, dumb they were or whatever. And you're sitting there reading them going, this is not dumb. So I don't know what the heck you're talking about, but um, you know, it, it, it's, it's definitely the, it was kind of it, part, part of it. I think the appeal, the appeal was kind of having a secret, uh, a secret place where, you know, where you could read stories that were, that were different than everybody else was reading, you know? Um, so that was part of it. And then just, I love to draw and I'd been drawing forever. And, uh, and my, I had a friend named Harry who kind of, um, well, I had two friends, Harry and Eddie, and they both basically, uh, were always drawing comics and I just started doing what they did. And, uh, and, they they basically topped off in high school and I kept going. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, yeah, it was like a big, you know, it was a big social thing as well as just a, you know, a th- the the comics themselves. Do you remember what your uh, what your first published comic was? Yeah, um, my first. Well, okay. Now do you mean okay? So here's one of the weirdest things that I that I that I found out like years later when i was in when i was in college we had a a comic book uh club and um so we would publish our own comics right so i had comics published there and i know that sounds like it's not a big deal but i was at Syri- i was at syracuse university and the people i was publishing comics with were uh let's see fred van lenty ryan dunlavy and uh donato giancola who's like the world famous a book cover illustrator and oh, Fred wow. Van Lee, Spider-Man and he co-created action philosophers and other things with, with Ryan Dunlavy. So like, and that was our little group of comic book. There were a couple other people who also have gone on to like make movies and things like that. So it's like this whole, this little group of like comic geeks over in the corner. So while it wasn't like super professional, uh, you know, comics is where we all kind of cut our teeth. And then um, I was also doing a daily newspaper strip. And I think that's really where I learned how to do what I was doing. Um, it was five days a week. And strangely enough, and it, 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 it's kind of funny. I was, I, there were 20,000 20, papers printed every day with my comic in it. And I found out years later that there were books at Marvel that I worked on that sold less than that. So it was like... <laughs> Damn, you know, like, and that was a day, 20,000 a day. So, uh, so, so I got to like, and, and it was immediate, like I'd do a strip and then the next day I'd find out whether people liked it or not. And then I would get, you know, it was like, it was like kind of a baptism of fire. You'd learn what you were doing. And then, um, when I got out of, when I got out of college, my first like professionally published book was, uh, was Spider-Woman number three. No, sorry. No, that's wrong. It was Iron Man 299, 293, I don't know, 290 something or other. Um, I did like a five page story in the back of Iron Man. Um, and then uh, and then the next thing I did was a was Spider Woman three and four from the Spider Woman limited series from back then. Um, and then from there, I basically jumped around to all the different comic book companies. <laughs> So you've worked with a lot of different writers and editors and different publishers and different schemes at different times. So I figure you would have some real insight on this one. Um, Where do good collaborations come from? Is there a, uh, is there a formula to it? Anything that you universally have to do to get it right? Well, that's really, you know, that's a really good question because, <laughs> because uh, w- I've been thinking about that a lot lately. Um, so the, when, when you're working with, so when I, okay, I started out kind of doing independent comics because I was doing my own, my own thing a lot uh, before I started working at Marvel. I was doing my own, you know, my own comics and I was working with guy with, with people who would later on become professional comic writers as well and, and artists as well. So I kind of learned there that like it had to do a lot with everybody kind of um, like with, with as an, as a, as an 
artist having the opportunity to be a part of the story creation process um, rather than just being kind of ha handed a script. Um, because uh, when I when I when when I got to Marvel and I was I had been doing all this stuff like I'd been doing all like I'd been writing my own scripts and then I'd been working with uh, some writers like Fred Van Lenti before you know when I was still in school and then I, I I started working at Marvel and I got handed a Marvel style script which at the time was like maybe a page and a half of text maybe two pages of text uh, that was basically telling me what to do for the entire 24 page issue. So I had to kind of figure out like the pacing, the storytelling, what happened on every page, how it were, how each page, you know, laid out and everything like that, uh, kind of on my own. And I, it was kind of a baptism of fire because I really had no idea what I was doing. And so, um, I kind of had this, and then, and then I moved on to DC and I was kind of shocked because DC handed me this script that had panel by panel descriptions. Right. And I was like, so I went from this place where I was making all the decisions or it felt like it, or I was making a lot of them, maybe not all of them, but I was making quite a few to this place where, well, can I change these panels if they're not working out visually? Uh, I guess I'll just trust what the writer did, you know? And so, so the, so the, it was, for a while there, it was trying to find out what the footing was, where, you know, how the collaboration worked, like, like uh, how you work with an editor and, or how you work with an, a writer. And what I found is my, my, my favorite space to be is to, is to work with someone who is willing to work back and forth with you, like where I can say like, you know, when I'm working with David or when I worked with Fred, um, they can say, okay, well, this is what we're thinking about for this page and I'll do a sketch. And I'll say, oh, wow, I didn't think of it that way. Okay, let's try that. And then I'll read what they wrote. And I'll say, oh, wait, let's change the expression here. And so it really becomes this back and forth. Um, and I think the best for me has always been when I'm sitting in the room with the person and we're laying out the book together. Because uh, there's an energy that comes from like just that, that quick collaboration. And uh, I kind of miss the days of like, cause for a while I was, li I was in a, um, a studio in Brooklyn with like Dean Haspiel and, um, oh gosh, now I'm going to blank on everybody else's name. Uh, <laughs> I can remember all their first names, Simon Fraser, um, all, but a whole bunch of different, like Riley Brown was there. Uh, um, oh gosh, Becky Cloonan basically. And, and it was like this rotating cast of people in and out of the studio. And one of the greatest things there was just being able to like show your work to other people and, and to like get, get like, get feedback and get honest feedback. Like, okay, that works. That doesn't work or, or whatever. Um, because, you know, working alone can be very difficult to, you know, like I was actually just, I actually posted something about that earlier today where I was like, I had to restart a page I was working on because I just, I didn't realize it wasn't working until I was done with it and then went, oh, I can't hand that in. So I had to start over. Um, and not for any other reason than my own personal, like, you know, I just didn't like it. And, uh, but it's, it's funny how like that would have been caught if I'd been working with someone else. Like we would have had this back and forth time and I would have had a lot more confidence in what I was doing with it because I would have had that kind of, it's already been, there's already been someone looking at it and kind of going, oh yeah, that works or this doesn't work or whatever. And sometimes it's, I just find that if you can trust the other person to be, and they can trust you where, you know, like it's almost to me um, a lot like, uh, you know, you hear about people doing um, not stand up comedy. What's it called? Uh, where people. Um, improv. Improv. Thank you. Yeah. Where like, you know, a good story frequently I found is like the writer will come with the idea We'll, or I'll come with an idea and we'll sit down and we'll start talking about it. And then it, it morphs into something completely new because the entire time you're yes anding each other, you know, you're like, Oh yeah, that's cool. And what if this happened, you know, and the next thing you know, the story shapes up in this really intriguing way. Like 
some of my favorite things is when I get on a phone call with with a writer and we're sitting there just like I'm pacing through my studio talking as loud as I can about whatever the story is because we're so excited about the story. Um, I, I, I've had I've had hour long hours of long conversations with some writers where we're like, you know, oh, yeah, this is great. We could do this and that. And then the character can go and do this. And I think the thing that I never really quite figured out was where, how an editor fits into that. Um, like it, it was, it's always been a little, like the role of the editor, like I, I know they're very important, but sometimes it feels like at times editors I've had in the past have sometimes stood in the way of, the kind of the two creative voices kind of going, okay, what are we doing here? You know, um, and not in a neg- not necessarily in a purposely negative way, but just kind of in a, well, they have to send the script to the editor, the editor reads it over and then sends it to me. So I, we don't get that back and forth kind of uh, collaborative uh, feeling going on. Um, so, so it can be a little bit, uh, what do you call it? It can be a bit of a stickler sometimes. Um, when the when in a way like the editor is kind of interpreting what the writer wrote, so if you have any questions, you ask the editor, and then the editor answers rather than the writer answering. So it can be a little, it can be sometimes, you know, fine if the editors knows what they're doing and they're really good, but it can be sometimes kind of distracting. Like when um, like when you're used to, I was working with David Gallagher, and we've been working on High Moon together, and we've been working on Only Living Boy together, and then we did we did a project with Marvel. And suddenly he had to send his script into the editor and we're like, wait, what? Like, so the editor was looking at them between the, looking at his script between him and me, which was weird because he and I usually had like long conversations before practically any page was laid out or drawn. So the second time we worked, we basically walked into Marvel with a, we worked with them. We walked into Marvel with a, um, with a, basically a laid out, a laid out story, pretty much ready to go. And then they were like, yeah, if you want to edit it, go ahead. But this is what we're thinking. So rather than handing them a, you know, a, a typical script, we handed them a, like a, a, you know, a, a, a practically a whole story. Did that answer That's your awesome. question? No, that, yeah, that <laughs> definitely answers the, the question. And then some, then this is fascinating. Um, so where does, where does the story begin? Does it, does it start with a world or a subject? Um, where do you like to, to to start work with it when you're collaborating with someone? You know, it, it's funny. I think whenever I've done something, whenever I've worked on stuff, each different project kind of came from somewhere different. Like um, the, well, I worked on this book with Fred Van Lente called The Silencers. That's one of my, it's still one of my favorite projects I worked on. And uh, basically we were just, my memory is that we were musing on the idea of like, like reading comic books and going, why are these criminals always going after the heroes? That doesn't make any sense. Like if I was a criminal, I wouldn't want the hero to even know I was there. It's not like bank robbers chase down and hunt cops. Right. So like, if I was a criminal, I would just rob the bank and run away. I wouldn't want to go face off with Spider-Man or whatever. Right. So it kind of built into this. Well, what, you know, it kind of built from that idea, that conversation into, well, what if the mafia had superpowers and, uh, and, uh, and what would that be like if it was like the Godfather, you know, that kind of familial Godfather situation, but with, with, with a, in a world where there are superpowers, you know, would they, would they go hunt down cops or superheroes? No, they would just be killing each other and trying to avoid getting caught by the, by the superheroes as much as possible. They would just, they would do anything they could to not ever meet a superhero. Right. Cause why would you want a superhero? It's like, why would a criminal want the cops to come? They never do. So the idea would be that like they're involved in all these criminal acts that, you know, that are under the, under the radar of the, uh, of the heroes, right? Under the, you know, so the heroes have no idea. And of course, in the course of the story, they end up having to 
because of the point of the story, they have to kind of break their rule and deal with, you know, deal with the superheroes. But the, the point of the story was to not deal with the superheroes. And so that was that one. And then like, you know, um, and then other stories kind of come out of like a character. So with um, the only living boy and with the only living girl, the, the, the main thrust of that was, uh, David Gallagher and I were talking about I Am Legend. And it was like, well, why are all of the characters who end up in the zombie apocalypse so well suited to handle the problem? Um, you know, <laughs> they, they, they're idea. always, you know, they're always muscular and they're always like, they're always suited for it. Well, what if it was a little kid, right? What if it was a kid all by himself in that kind of thing? And then we we kind of went down that road for a while and we were like, you know, it might be because like, of course, the immediate idea is, well, the first thing that would happen is their family would all be zombies and that would be really tragic. And this book would be really, really dark. So we didn't want to go. We still wanted to have a serious story, but we didn't want to go that dark. So we were like, okay, so what could we do that's similar to that? Well, we want a kid who's alone and not, not a kid who's like, like, cause like some people have said, like, I, I've, it's funny. Cause like when I, I've heard people mention when I told them the idea of, of only living boy, uh, which is, a, you know, basically a boy alone in a world uh, with aliens and monsters and robots and whatever like that, trying to figure out how to survive. That's basically the pitch. Right. But when we've, um, you know, I've had other people say, Oh, well that's a lot like Kamani or, more accurately, the real the real quote is, that's just like Kamandi. And I'm like, no, have you ever seen Kamandi? He's like a big, buff, 18-year-old guy. Calling him a boy is kind of like ridiculous. What, what we were talking about is a kid who barely has gotten out of the carrying a teddy bear with him age kind of a kid. You know, he's, he's age of 13 trying to figure out how to just be human. And then he's suddenly thrown into this world where he actually has to survive all by his own and kind of figure out how to how to you know maneuver this world where everything is foreign to him and everything is is you know threatening potentially and so the you know that that really started with that idea of how does a kid you know how would a kid survive how would a kid make it through that and and then it built from there and then and high moon i so i think a lot of the stories like even with the silencers, once we came up with that idea, we came up with this character, the Cardinal, and the Cardinal kind of drove all the story from there there on out. So I think a lot of it is like you kind of come up with a little bit of the world, but it really wraps around your main character. Like who is that main character? And if that main character is not compelling, then you have to kind of go back to the drawing board because you can build whatever crazy world you want, but if you don't have characters that people care about, uh, it's just a, you know, a boring video game or, you know what I mean? Like there's no, you need to be able to have characters that, uh, that grow and change and, and have a, a real, uh, compelling story to them. Like the, the thing is, you know, the Godfather with superpowers and the silencers, the thing that made that really, strong was that the main character was a mafiosa leader of a, a was a you know mafia hitman leader of a group of superpowered hitmen and he wants to quit and how do you quit being part of the mob um you know that that you don't usually walk away from that life so he's trying to figure out how to walk away from the life and survive and so suddenly you have this compelling character he's the leader of this group they, he doesn't necessarily trust them. They don't necessarily trust him because they're all criminals and he needs to figure out a way of getting out of that life without getting killed. And so suddenly that became like a really, you know, it became a really compelling story. And, and with High Moon, it's, you know, it was a, a guy who becomes a werewolf who never wants to become a werewolf. So he doesn't take advantage of it. He He hunts werewolves because he hates himself and he hates the things that werewolves do. So he, you know, it's the old West and he goes out and hunts down werewolves. And I think no matter what the world is, a character, you know, a character who 
you can find if you can find a character that kind of drives a narrative the world kind of can be whatever world you want it to be um i mean it's definitely important to build you know to world build it's definitely important to to kind of create the world around the characters but at the same time i think that's a little bit more malleable in story if your main character is really really solid i mean you don't want to be inconsistent but um but i think having your your main character or characters uh be driven forward by a uh by by a major story point like the only living girl you know she's trying to un- she's trying to outlive what her dad had done she's trying to right the wrongs that her father did and so she's kind of living this with this dark legacy and she's living in a world made by him that she has to kind of um she has to kind of live with and kind of and 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 live with that reputation and try and change it so the if you if you don't have that compelling character i think that that you're 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 kind of sunk from the beginning so i think it it does in the end now that i've rambled around a lot i think in the end it has to do with who's your character and what's their problem and what are they trying to solve or what do they need to learn so do you have a a thought on uh on how to approach diversity and representation you know uh that's a really it's a really interesting and sticky situation uh because what we've done like you know we we did i did with david we did the uh high moon and the first main character of high moon was an old scottish guy and by the end of the first book he's replaced by a a a former black slave so he you know who becomes the main character for the rest of the series and that's really it was a really like you know how do we know we're doing it right and i think part of that is figuring out who the character is personality wise first and approach their kind of whatever their unique you know in this case minority situation is approach that as how does that how is that affect how does that life affect this character and make them who they are but how do you also honor the fact that this is a character outside of that as well so not just make them only a character who is dealing with the thing that makes them different but make them that a part of who they are and as long as i think you're honest with your characters and with how you uh represent them um i think you know you won't go wrong i think that the hard part is just trying not to make too many assumptions <laughs> ask a lot of questions um i think asking a lot of questions really helps uh and 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 listening right so that you don't do something that is you know totally off or totally out of the you know what do you call it i'm trying to think of any words something you know something that totally you know is insulting or anything like that like it's basically just being respectful of everybody else's story you know um the if you if you if you respect the people you're writing about and you respect the people that you're writing to you take the time to learn who you're writing about and to and you write what you think works for that and i think sometimes there's going to be opp- possibilities where you're going to fall flat on your face um and it, and it has been there have been times cuz like our main character from the only living girl is also african american and you know there have been times when we're like okay so we're writing you know we're 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 two older white guys writing a story about a you know, a female black heroine, a uh, teenage female black heroine. We're like, how the heck do we write this? And, you know, it naturally flowed out of the first series, which was, you know, a boy. So we got that, right? You know, so suddenly once we once we had to switch to this new main character, we really were thinking about, you know, who is this person? Not, not what is their type, but who are they? Like, and who is she? And who, what is she about and what is she concerned about and what are the 
things that, um, what do you call it, that drive her and how does the world then perceive her and how does she deal with that? Um, and I think that's the most respectful way to do it. I don't know. <laughs> um, cause it is, it can be, it can be hard like to, to, to try to write for an audience or to create things for an audience. That's not you, but it's something that's been done, you know, well and badly for years. Uh, and I guess the, the thing is just as, as long as you, I'd like to think that as long as you are treating them, the characters with the same kind of respect that you would treat any other character uh, and getting to know them and know what they're all about, I think I think you do pretty well. Sort of related to that, um, normally this is a question that I ask people who are like exclusively writers, but in your case, I, th- I think there's I think there's more here. So, how do characters that you create and and collaborate on um, how do they find their voices? Huh. That's actually really really interesting because I think. When I, okay, so the first, the first professional comic that I actually spent, like I did, like I said, I did that that five page comic of uh, of Iron Man, but that was like a little five page thing. But the first comic I really got to get into was Spider Woman, and the thing that was really exciting to me was, and this was like ninety three. I really wanted to. My my goal was I wanted to make a a female character that wasn't there just to be the, you know, the, what do you call it? Um, Essentially, I wanted a female character that kicked butt and wasn't like a pinup model. So I tried to treat her as someone, because the whole story was about her daughter being kidnapped. And, you know, it was, was, you know, I think Roy Thomas wrote it. Um, And so what I tried to do was think about rather than sitting there and going, oh, what would a, you know, what would that other person look like doing this? I kind of modeled her after me. (laughs) So if I was angry, she looked like my, you know, my scream, like when she's fighting guys and kicking them in the face, she was punching them with my grimace. You know what I mean? Because I didn't want to like pretty her up or change her attitude. Um, so I probably made the meanest looking spider woman um, because, you know, she's gritting her teeth and she's sweating and she's punching things and she's covered in blood and dirt and stuff like that. Cause I didn't really know that we weren't supposed to do that um, <laughs> at the time. Um, but yeah, the comics code. Well, no, no, it wasn't even the comics code. It was just that when I first got into comics, female characters were essentially quite often window dressing, you know? Not always, but at the time, like Jim Lee and and Rob Liefeld were were like ruling the 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 business, and a lot of that was you know all about uh, kind of they weren't really characters; they were just there to stand up, stand and look pretty in the background. So when I had this series that was featuring her as a character, I wanted to like I didn't really you know I I didn't in the rest of the business, what I was doing was kind of not what you were supposed to do. You know what I mean? Like she was supposed to, I think, I think the idea would be that she's supposed to look pretty a lot, you know? Um, and I didn't do that. So I think that from an artist, when the character, from my point of view as an artist, when the character gets their voice, it's, it's how do they move their body? How do they, how do they move their face? How do they express different emotions? Um, so, you know, it all comes down to, you know, way back when there was, I remember reading this book over and over again that Will Eisner did called Comics and Sequential Art. And he has this whole sequence of this, uh, like a, looks like a hippie from the seventies performing Shakespeare on a roof. And, uh, and he, you know, basically He's moving his hands in this very, you know, evocative kind of Shakespearean actor kind of way. And he's, he's doing the whole, you know, like, you know, throwing his body around like a, like a Royal Shakespeare, you know, company actor uh, does. And when I saw that, I was like, okay, so these characters have to act 
right? So they have to be themselves. And so trying to figure out like, how does this person act versus that person act? And sometimes, you know, like some, to me, that's, that's really important. Sometimes like, I think there are some, uh, there are some characters that have never been given that much thought um, or have ended at this character broods all the time. And then there are other characters that, uh, you know, that you, 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 that you, you, you see people really give a huge amount of, um, of personality to just from their motions and their movements. And I, I kind of really try to think like one of my favorite pages of, uh, the only living boy is this scene where he's sitting on top of a, uh, well, he's sitting on top of a spaceship, but he's sitting out, like looking out at the sky and his friend Thea comes up and they just basically are sitting there talking and it's like a two page sequence and it's all just, you know, them sitting and talking with their hands and with their faces and their eyes. And, um, and I felt like when I did that, that was like, like the point where it wasn't just doing, you know, um, this kind of, you know, stoic character standing there looking grim and gritty. It was doing two people that were actually people and not, uh, not ciphers or not, you know, not mannequins moving around a scene, you know? Um, so I've always tried to kind of allow the characters to emote. So each person has their own. And I mean, obviously to, to different levels of success. Um, I think it's really easy for me to draw anger. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but trying to get all the other emotions in characters, I remember, uh, th this one character I've talked about before, the Cardinal in the silencers, the cool thing about him was he didn't emote at all. So while everyone else is jumping around and acting more like, you know, superheroes or supervillains, he just stands there and smokes a cigarette and that's, and talks. And he's scary because he's the only one who is completely un, uh, unfazed by anything that happens. Hello, my sweet ones. We have to take a quick commercial break to pay some bills, but more with Steve Ellis after these messages. The whole idea is that the, the, the silencers are all criminals but when we conceived of who they were they were they could all essentially be villains from someone else's comic so the cardinal is this thinking villain who's very very you know, he plans everything out he's very strategic so like we kind of always imagine him as being like a batman villain uh and then there's this character hair trigger who is he lives three seconds in the future as well as right now, or was it three or 10 seconds? And so is constantly waiting for the world to catch up to him. Uh, and he has no skills, but because he knows where things are gonna be before they're there, he carries guns with him and just shoots everything. So he's really obnoxious as a character. And so <laughs> you have this one guy who's completely impatient, constantly like, drinking drinking soda and like just trying to like get a buzz to like to cut out the insanity of the world for him because he's just waiting for everyone to catch up and then this other character who just stands there with a cigarette in his mouth and watches and so the the visual difference is huge you know, you've got this one guy who's just bouncing everywhere and this other guy who's just sitting there you know taking a drag off his cigarette and talking and so it it it's really it's really fun to 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 characterize those are very extreme you know kind of an extreme thing but 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 like you know it's it's the attitude by how they stand and like and it, and it's fun because it, it it goes both in the art and in the writing it's like there are poses that i know that cardinal would never stand in cuz he would look like an idiot and he doesn't ever want to look like an idiot because he's too cool so he would never he would never pull a superman pose or a you know, or a Batman standing on a gargoyle pose, 
he'd just stand in the corner and lean on the wall because all of those other poses are way too flamboyant. You know what I mean? Like, so, so there's like, the character has opinions about how he would be portrayed. And so if you got it wrong, it just doesn't feel right. Um, so at a certain point, the characters kind of live in you. Um, I know I've definitely working on different characters, especially when I'm brand new to a character, trying to figure out, you end up with, I think, some kind of standard character poses that just kind of fill in at first until you really get to know them. And then when you get to know them, you're like, oh, no, this guy wouldn't do that. He'd, he'd sit in his chair really relaxedly or he'd sit upright because he's too uptight or whatever. And I, I remember one of the coolest things I got to do a few years ago is I worked on Breaking Bad, uh, on some comics for Breaking Bad. Um, and I was working with uh, one of the writers from the show and we were doing scenes. Have you ever seen Breaking Bad? I love that okay. show. Breaking so, Bad was uh, one of my favorites. Well, one of the things that was really, really cool working on the book was I, I had to deep dive and watch every episode like a madman. Um, I mean, part of that was just guilty pleasure because I really didn't have to. But like, you know, I did for work, you know, as you do. And um, the coolest thing was through the whole process of drawing Walter White, seeing his posture change depending on who he was and then having to draw that because when he's Walter White with his wife at the beginning of the series, or if he's Walter White, like in normal world, he's kind of dumpy. He kind of, he walks with a, his shoulders down, he slumps and his, his spine isn't straight and he kind of drags along. And then when he's Heisenberg, he's completely ramrod straight. Like his back is like, you know, like, 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 like he's super, super straight up and tall. And I think he gains like six inches just from the way he stands. And, um, and so drawing that was really, really cool because I started seeing like just how much the, the, that he could transform himself. And you knew just by watching the show, you knew who he was when he walked in the door of a room, whether he was Heisenberg or whether he was Walter White, you know what I mean? Like you could just tell because he was the way he was standing and the way he was walking through the room. And I mean, there are times when he's, you know, he's Heisenberg who's freaking out. So he becomes Walter White. But when he's Heisenberg on a tear, he is scary because he's super straight up tall. You know, um, there's a great scene in that where um, in the show where uh, his brother-in-law and he finally figures out who he is. And, uh, and Walter is talking to him as kind of dumpy Walter White. And they're standing in his garage. And he kind of brushes off what his brother-in-law was saying. And then he walks out. And he stops. And then he stands straight up. And he turns around. And at that point, you know he's Heisenberg. And he just walks right up. And now he's suddenly like scary. And, you know, this, this is when he threatens his life, you know. And so like that kind of knowing that these characters have different postures and facial expressions. And, um, and, and I guess part of that is where being a cartoonist comes in. Because um, I'm not, you're, you know, I'm not a... Uh, a standard superhero guy. So like my characters are a lot more bouncy and cartoony than a lot of the, the old, well, at least the old school standard superhero. I think that's changed a lot in the last 10 years or so, but the older kind of more, you know, stoic superhero thing. Um, I was not really the right guy for that because I wanted to get into the heads of the characters. Well, this is just, this is just so much fun. I, I really appreciate it. Uh you making the time to see me tonight. Oh, sure. Um, do you have a, a particular favorite type of story to tell? Ooh. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, okay, the, to be completely honest, the story I seem to tell over and over and over again is the underdog. The, the story of the underdog, which is like kind of 
everybody's story to a degree, but I typically am more interested in the character who, who, uh, doesn't necessarily have all the answers. Um, I guess, you know, like, like if I was to compare like, okay, so, so here's a good, good, good me, like way of explaining that is Superman is never the underdog. And it's one of the things I have a beef with about DC characters that frequently they're never the underdog, you know, like they're the richest guy with all the toys or they're the Amazon with all the powers and all the good things and all the seriousness and they're, you know, or whatever. And the thing that always attracted me to like characters like Spider-Man was, okay, he's a poor kid who lives with his aunt. He caused the death of his dad, his uncle, and he can't, can't pay his rent. And so like, I think all the characters that I've, ever been compelled to uh to write have always been or to draw have always been characters who have uh who have the deck stacked against them from the beginning um and it's funny because at one time i i went into uh dc with the an editor back in the 90s and i had these pitches for like two or three stories that i was really excited about and after giving him the pitches the the editor looked at me and he he's no longer at dc he's long gone but the editor looked at me and he's like he's like these aren't dc characters i'm like what do you mean he's like well in this story one of these guys is kind of made fun of for the mistakes he made as a superhero and i'm like yeah so you, you know i wanted him to be kind of like down in the dumps and want to quit and then, you know so i wanted to start him off as a character who wanted to quit being a hero and then is forced back into the game and he's like, but DC heroes are universally loved by the people of the DC universe. So why would they ever want to quit? And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, they're, they're, everyone loves the DC heroes. Like the DC heroes can't do any wrong. They're paragons of goodness. So, you know, like, and, and, and that was kind of when I went, wait a minute. So no wonder the only DC hero I ever really liked was like Lobo, you know, <laughs> cause he was just, <laughs> you know, it was like Bugs Bunny, you know? I, I was like, wow, now I understand. Like that conversation made me go, okay, so it's just that I, I tell a different, I like a different kind of a story. Uh, and to me, there's, I particularly like stories that have a character that grows and changes and isn't the same at the end. Um, so if a character ends up being the same character at the, like, it always used to bug me, like you'd watch these episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, and these epic things would happen in an episode, and then the next episode, they'd all be exactly the same again. And I was like, how did that happen? Like, they're, you know, he just had this revelation about his life, and you're telling me that doesn't have any effect on the next episode? So, like, I, I, I never really liked that. I, was, I like the, the idea of characters transforming, which is like classic writing, but it's not serial writing. You know, serials kind of demand that the characters revert back to a certain state stasis so that they can tell another story from that same spot. And uh, I like the idea that the characters are irrevocably changed. And so the character being someone who is an underdog at the beginning doesn't have all the answers, doesn't, you know, doesn't know how to handle things, that tends to really... Uh, or or is just not the strongest kid on the block. You know, those are the stories that kind of appeal to me. So I think that's why the characters who, you know, that's why the only living boy is a, is a, you know, a 13 year old kid on an alien world that says, you know, that's super dangerous because I didn't want him to be prepared for anything. Um, and it was his job to kind of figure his way out. And I think that's, so for me, that's the kind of the story is, you put your character through their paces and you make them figure out how to solve it, how to solve the problem. Nice. So um, do you work uh, still with a, a pen and paper or, uh, or do you work digital? digital? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I am probably about 50, 50 because I, 
there are times when I'm like, I love that piece. I don't want to just have it be digital and disappear, you know. Um, even though I have stacks of original art that just sit there, uh, yeah. I, there's something about having an original, and there's just something about the process that I like. Uh, but I do a lot of stuff digitally now just because, um, well, the programs have gotten really good. Like, uh, I really enjoy this program called uh, Clip Studio, and it makes certain things so much easier that uh, that I can just get right down to the drawing, which I want to do, rather than fighting with like perspective <laughs> and stuff like that. Clip Studio is amazing. What? Yeah, it, it, yeah. I mean, the, the perspective tool is incredible, um, and like I, I couldn't live without it. Like I, I'm trying to do perspective on a piece of paper right now, and I'm like, why am I doing this to myself? Like, what torture? <laughs> like with a ruler and a pencil, I'm like, what the? Why? Why? I could literally just do this in like ten minutes on Clip Studio. I don't know. <laughs> and here I am trying to fight this on this piece of paper. And I'm like, well, that that's kind of what I mean. Like, like I'm 50, 50 in that. Like, I just can't, I can't force myself to completely drop paper, but, um, you know, uh, I probably should. <laughs> I hear you. So speaking of digital, um, digital comics have been sort of, becoming more and more uh, normal over the years. Do you have a preference for paper versus digital when you read them? You know, it's funny. When I read them, I'm definitely, well, okay. I'm probably more, still more of a paper guy, even though like I've been reading, once I got the, I got, I got an iPad and I've been reading comics on that. And that kind of feels like the right experience because I, 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 I don't think I want to, I've never wanted to sit on my big computer at my desk and read. Just seems like an uncomfortable place to do it. So like, I, I, I love curling up with a book on like a couch or on the bed or whatever, and just sitting and reading. And so sitting on the computer and reading, like in the more traditional sense of a computer with the upright screen and all that has always been kind of felt a little bit weird to me. And when reading, like reading things on a phone, uh, depending on if it's done for the, if it's made for the phone, I like it, but I've seen too many where they just took a comic book page and pasted it on the phone and it's hard to read. Um, Cause you have to pinch and you have to squeeze and you have to, you know, rotate and whatever. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, so like once I found the iPad, and could read comics on that, that really seemed to make a lot more sense. So suddenly digital seems a lot more reasonable, but um, I still do like having the comics on hand because there's something, I don't know what it is, maybe because I'm old. Uh, there's something about, uh, I don't know, like holding it in your hand that feels, that feels nice. I don't know. Um, also, it's not, shining in your face it's reflecting light you know rather than projecting light so i don't know i i i'm like a weird person where i like if i have a script from someone even if i'm doing the if, even if i'm doing all the artwork on the computer i print the script out on paper and do all my notes all my sketches out on on the margins so i think i don't think i'm ever going to get away from paper uh, but like, you know, Dave, Dave Gallagher and I were doing, um, we did this book box 13, uh, for comiXology when comiXology first came out and we literally fashioned the way you read the comic for the iPhone, for the shape of the iPhone. Um, so every panel was the size of a screen of the iPhone. So all you had to do to, to read it was to just tap and you'd read panel by panel. So there weren't really pages. It was just like a, a like a long panel, you know, long, like a very, very long strip, like a 150 page strip. Um, and that worked for me because it's like, because it was meant to be read that way. And I've read a few other comics, like um, Riley Brown did one at one point where I was like, okay, so this is taking advantage of what digital can bring to 
the uh, to the comics. But I, I I don't like it when like I don't so much like it when everyone wants to add music and voices and all and sound effects to it. I just kind of want to read it. But um, if if the person who has made the book thought about what the final output of it was, whether it's paper or whether it's the cell phone, I think that's when it's uh, or or the computer screen or whatever. That's when it's that's when it's best. So I think like um, I'd rather read if a comic is made for digital, I would read it that way. If it's made for print, I would read it that way. I know that sounds kind of obvious, but do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, totally. It's it's something I'm always asking people because uh, you know there is is no shortage of uh, of opinions in either direction. Oh yeah. But sometimes yeah. I'll talk to older artists, and uh, and what they'll tell me is that uh, there's no difference. And then I'll talk to people who work on comicsology stuff, and they'll be like, "Oh yeah, the gutters are different, and you have to you do the frames this way and that way." And, well, you can uh, manipulate it. It's a really interesting topic. Yeah, I mean, if you if you if you know how the comicsology thing works, it's another it's a it's a different reader, it's a different reading experience, you know. Like and and to call it just the same as a paper comic is kind of wrong, you know, because um, it's not like. And that's I think where where I have a problem with it, um, is if you if you go okay, this is going to be on the phone. Like what we did was we when we did box thirteen we made it for the phone and then printed it out in eight panel grids as a comic so it didn't quite work as well as a print comic because it was eight panel grids right but it was still interesting as a as a print comic but it was better I think on the phone so I think it's just if you're how you're considering it's a lot of it's really how you consider your your output, you know, it's, it, it's like, if you're, if you're making a TV show versus making a movie, well, you have a whole different ratio to consider. You've got episodes to consider. So you have to write your story differently, you know, versus, you know, movies that are two and two hours long. And, you know, like there's all kinds of different considerations. So I think it's kind of, uh, not thinking it through if you just say it's all the same, you know, does it does it change the formula like uh, the page turns? How does that work? Oh God, yeah, yeah, totally. Because I mean, like, here's the thing. Like, I don't know if do you have a do you have a do you read comics on your cell phone? Almost exclusively. Okay. Yeah. So when you read a comic on the cell phone, and it's a traditional, let's say, Marvel comic or modern Marvel comic, where the panels aren't necessarily always squares. And there's extra space around the panels on the original art. Um, do you ever feel like you're missing something because you're not seeing the whole page? I think I, I think Marvel's gotten better about it now that they uh, sort of realize that comicsology exists and they think about it when they're producing. But um, yeah, the DC is the worst. Um, with the triangle panels and you have to zoom in and out to see what's going on. And they do these double page spreads that they just don't translate, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, you have this glorious double page spread with all this detail, but it's only three inches by two inches, you know, like how, how are you supposed to read that? I mean, like that, I, 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 yeah, I thoroughly. So it, yeah, it, it's one of those things where, um, Oh, now I, I forget what you were asked because I asked you that question for a specific reason. But you, you, you see it like right where where it's it's hard to look at a comic when it's too detailed on the phone. The the reason I started doing it was because um, lettering in indie comics is all over the board, and sometimes it's great, and sometimes it's not. But yeah. uh, as I'm getting older here, you know, my eyes just aren't what they used to be. And when it's on the phone, just for some reason, uh, the letters are, are a lot easier to read. So even if it's a book that I own in print, I'll, I'll still read it on the phone because I know that 
um, I'll always be able to to read it. And if I really need to, I zoom in. And I feel like an old person saying that. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a question. That, like, like, okay, this is a question I have for you, but it's also a question I'm asking myself. Like, there are certain artists who I can be like, I know I could read that on the phone and in print and equally love it. Like Mike Mignola. I think I could read his stuff on the phone and in print and enjoy them both because I think because his style is simple or complexly simple. You know what I mean? It's, it's bold and it's really like, it's not about lots of little detailed lines. And so therefore you get, you can look at a panel and instantly understand what you're looking at without any question. And so because of that, I think it translates, you could read his comics like if they were printed the size of a postage stamp, because they're so, uh, each panel is so, um, what do you call it? Broken down to the most simple kind of uh, elements. But I don't think that works with, you know, every project out there. And I think that's, that's awesome. I think there shouldn't, there should be some comics that are just too, complex to be read on a phone that you need to have a big printout so you can put it up on your wall, you know, because <laughs> there's something nice about having a, like, like you were asking me whether I do digital or, 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 uh, or, or uh, by hand. And the reason I would do something by hand is so that I can put it up somewhere. You know, if it's a big piece that I want to really see again, and I want to, I want to live with, then I, I want to do it by hand, you know, um, and then you get to see all the, 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 the line weight and the, the, the brush strokes and whatever else is in there. Whereas if it's on the computer, I'll, I'll probably never look at it again until, except in its print form, you know? That's true. And, you know, sometimes you just get a hankering to read a comic digitally. At the moment, you know? <laughs> so you don't have to get out of bed, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. that, that I don't blame. Yeah, that, that sounds like a good idea. I'll have to think about that. I don't know what my three in the morning comic would be, though. Oh, I do. I do. Uh, mine's going to be, um, what do you call it? Uh, Wrong Earth. Oh, really? I love the Wrong Earth. By Tom Pyre. Oh, that's a great yeah. series. Yeah, Jamal's doing a great job with that, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the art's great. The, I love the way they have these little in-jokes, you know, throughout the series that you only get if you know who the writer and right. the artist is. Yeah, are. yeah. It's so yeah, funny. They're Tom Payer is a a really really clever writer. I don't, do you know Do you know his background? Because he he used to, I oh do. you do okay yeah because he he was I I actually oh you did okay cool because he show I, I just I know that yeah. he was doing stuff for you know he was one of the head editors at Vertigo and you can totally see his like everything that Ahoy does does feels like stuff that Vertigo could have been doing. Except the wrong Earth, which feels you know more superhero-y. but it's it's funny how it he he, he has a definite uh, imprint of what he likes that comes out very strongly in the stuff he edits and you know and chooses to publish as well as to create. It's kind of funny. It's really incredible. I mean, I've read nearly all of the whole oh, yeah. at this point, and so far there's only been one that I didn't like. Um, and that's incredible because yeah. I have really ridiculous standards for the books I enjoy. Um, and, you know, for them to have a, a batting average like that is it, just, it's mind blowing. I've never seen a single publisher do well, that. Well, I mean, the thing that makes them so good, I think, is that they don't ever do the same thing twice. You know? Like, none of the, none of the titles, yeah. like, none of the titles feel like they could have been another one of the titles. Like you wouldn't mix them with you wouldn't mix them up from you know one with the other, whereas like you know, I, I think so many of the other publishers who publish comics still have a. I mean, I, I'm not going to say that about like Dark Horse or or uh, IDW, but if you look at DC or Marvel, right, they're all they're all all, all superheroes, right? So at a certain point, they they all kind of overlap each other in that they all have the same a lot of the same themes, you know? Um, I love the fact that at Ahoy, you could have a book that's contemplating life and death and, you know, uh, and religion. And then another comic book that's, you know, 
that's dealing with, you know, superheroes changing dimensions, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, and, yeah. and, and that, that, that vast difference. And it's, it's funny because that, that used to be the thing that, that made DC so strong was when v- DC had vertigo to do that. You know, you could have an animal man being published back in the early nineties uh, alongside Superman and the DC in, in DCU, you know what I mean? And the animal man would be contemplating, you know, doing, you know, fourth wall, breaking the fourth wall and stuff like that. And, and Superman would just be fighting Lex Luthor. You know what I mean? Like, so I, I, I I'm, I'm, I'm more of a, I'm more of the, the make your superhero comics weird and thoughtful kind of guy than I am the, let's just have a, a, a problem of the week kind of a thing. I, I say if Neil Gaiman wants to kill a superhero. Oh yeah. Adam. Well, uh, <laughs> can I kill some superheroes too? <laughs> oh, sure. Sure. You can kill as many yeah. as you want. When I'm in charge of DC, you know, you could do it all. Every once in a while, you gotta, well, I mean, you gotta shake it up a bit. I mean, that was one, that was one of the things, like, I really wanted to do a story where a character had been, had lost their will to be a superhero. They, they lost their, they all, they basically, they screwed up, which they had already done in a book before I got there. They screwed up majorly. And then they were like, I don't want to do this anymore. This sucks. And they were going to quit. Right, they were just going to go to normal, literal normal life, like work a day job as a temp, you know, sitting in front of an office and trying to go on dates, and that was going to be the that was going to be like the the beginning of the story, and then, you know, and and the date makes fun of him because of the mistake he made as a superhero because they find out he's a superhero and he feels even worse about his life, and so basically he's just like super down and. The, D- the editor at the time was like, we can't do that. DC superheroes are the greatest. And I was like, so they're not human. You know, I'm like, <laughs> no, they're you not. Got, you know, the, the, I, I want to read stories about human beings, not about icons. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't understand that, that, uh, that idea of those unrelatable iconic characters. I'm totally with you. I, I think it's a, I, I don't know. At least for me, I think it's kind of an old person thing. I've been reading fewer, uh, fewer and fewer superheroes, and and more of the the really interesting sort of groundbreaking indie stuff where anything goes. You know, it's like the Wild West right now. Well, I mean, and that's that's the fun stuff. I mean, like the reason I got into comics wasn't to do Spider Spider Woman. The reason I got into comics was because Alan Moore did a comic book about back then. Alan Moore did a comic book about the JFK conspiracy. And I was like, they can do comics about anything. I want to do crazy. So the first comic I did with my friend, with Fred Van Lente that I did, that we did, we ended up having published was about a, 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 a character who um, becomes an, a, a, a policeman on the moon. And, and it was all about, oh, and it ends up, it. it gets really weird because the, I, I could describe it to you and you'll be like, what? Because we did this in the early 90s and the main character was a, there was a lot of evil people in the story. And one of them was a character who was a geneticist who wanted to create humans that didn't have either male or female um, identity. They basically made, but it was a, it was a, it was a twisted experiment because what they did was they made characters that looked female but had no primary female characteristics. They only had the secondary female characteristics. And the woman who created them was doing them as an experiment to basically see what you could, like basically a Nietzschean experiment, survival of the fittest, to see how they would survive being put through the worst conditions possible. And the, so, so, these little clone they're all the same person and each one they're all the same person identify female even though they don't have any primary you know female characteristics and as they grow they each move into different um lives on this moon base and one of them becomes a cop and she's very very angry because of how they were all treated as children and 
so she's kind of a very very abusive cop and uh and then she it's hard to describe it gets it gets a lot about it's a lot about human uh sexuality <laughs> because she at a certain point has to deal with the fact that she's actually not a she and it becomes a major part of who she is because it's the difference between what she's biologically versus what she is uh, what she's been told she was all her life and yeah. who she thinks she is. So she's kind of going through the eye of the needle of trying to figure out because she's always been told that she was something and never had an opportunity to be anything other than what she was told. And when she actually made a choice about what she could be, she became a killer. So it's, it's kind of a brutal story. <laughs> um, but when she actually, but the, basically the whole story is just breaks breaks her down into eventually figuring out who she is and a lot of people die along the way but it was but that's like that was like fred van linty wrote that with me um back then and and it was like that we wanted to do we wanted to do stories that were like people would you know back that were like those stories that we read uh in the late 80s early 90s where people were writing stuff that was totally whacked out like all the vertigo books and all that that's what i wanted to that's what i really wanted to be involved in um it just so happened that I was good at drawing the superheroes, you know, <laughs> I was good at drawing people jumping around all over the place, but the stories I, I'm really interested in telling is more the, the personal stories, the more uh, internal kind of stories. So, yeah. So like those God characters that kind of stand on the top of a building and stare off at everybody never really made sense to me. Me either. Um, so Beyond drawing comics, uh, I understand you teach. Yep. Um, I actually teach up at uh, Syracuse University. Uh, I teach illustration and, uh, and, and mostly drawing and uh, media arts, which is like I teach people how to use different types of paint and stuff like that and, and how to think about being an artist and stuff like that. I teach digital illustration as well. Like, so I'm, I, I kind of, I, I, I only teach one class a semester usually because it's just a side thing while I'm doing other stuff. Um, if I took any more classes than that, I'd probably never get any artwork done. But uh, but I, it's kind of like a one of those things I discovered later on that was something I was that I really really love. Um, so don't tell them this, but if they weren't paying me, I'd probably still do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was. Well, it's one of those things where, like, there's there's this awesome point when you can turn someone on to an idea, and it's really exciting to watch them kind of open up to a new idea, you know. And uh, and 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 I, and I love drawing, so I like to share that with people too. I bet it's fun to uh, to watch your students. Come. Oh yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, and and to see them. It's sometimes bewildering because you're watching them and you're going, what the heck are they doing? And totally bewildering. And then you see them a year later after they've taken your class and you're like, now I understand. That's awesome. Like, so sometimes you, you don't see the results then. You, you see them like two years later, they come back and they're like, your class was the one that taught me this. And it's the whole reason why I'm doing this now. And I'm like, that's awesome. You know, so, so it's really cool when I have like, I have students who are, you know, who've, who've gone on, like, cause I've been doing it since gosh 2004 so i have students who've like worked for dreamworks and done video game design done comics done you know all these different things that i'm like i kind of want to try that <laughs> but um but it's cool because like you know i i it started out as just a a lark because someone asked me if i wanted to teach a class and i was like yeah sure i'll try that and uh, and it was partially because I was I was new to a town and I didn't know anyone and I was like well okay if I can teach at least I'll meet students right and uh, and so you know it was it was a way of just getting out of my studio and uh, and then as time went on I just realized I really really liked it and they kept asking me back so I kept doing it <laughs> nice. yeah it's 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 and and, and it's it's one of those things I just didn't expect. Um, but it, 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 it's really exciting because I learn even more, like whenever I'm teaching, I always learn too, like from them and from just 
having to go over everything again, you kind of like, oh, that's why I did that, you know? <laughs> so with all of this going on, do you still have the time to uh, to read comics? Uh, not usually. <laughs> no, I, I usually get like <laughs> two or three. Like, it's funny, like I end up, I'll go to the comic book store that's near my house and the, the store owner probably hates me because I'll I'll show up every three or four months and kind of buy all my comics in one big batch and then disappear. Because I think if he had me coming in regularly, he'd be much happier because he knew, knows when I'm coming in and I'd have regular stuff. But basically what I do is I just kind of go in and kind of go, wow, that looks really cool. Or I heard about this one. I'm going to read that. And, and then I just pick them all up at once. And and then I sit down and I, I slowly pour over them over the next six months. And then I buy a, buy another batch. So I'm not like... If I still lived in Brooklyn and I was still living around the corner from Jamal Igle, I'd probably be walking to the comic book store every Wednesday with him. But <laughs> you know, but since I'm not there anymore, um, and I don't I don't have my companion, I don't do the Wednesday walk anymore as much as I as much as I miss it. Um because there's a the that's the one thing that I that I I'm I very much would like to see not go away is the idea of a comic book store as a social place. Uh, and sometimes it was a pretty toxic social place, so I don't miss that. But there was a place uh, in Brooklyn that I really liked because it was it was owned by a, a couple, Tom and Amy, and I forget their last names. And uh, and they just had a, had a really great vibe and you'd go into the store and everyone was welcome. And they put all the Marvels and DCs in the back. So all the things in the front were independent books. Uh, yeah, because their theory was if someone, they, you know, there's a big sign out front that says Mar that says comics. So if someone wants a Marvel comic, they know it's here. They just have to go to the back to get it. And that way they have to walk past all the good stuff, as they put it, <laughs> to get there. Uh, that's not my words. Do you remember, uh, do you remember the name of the story? Oh, here? crap. Um, I don't. Wow, it's a while back now. Uh, but basically, we, we used to go there quite often and, and and like all the people from my old studio would would have uh openings there and i'm totally blanking on the name of the store um when i was a, when i was a kid in brooklyn the one i went to was in uh it was in flatbush it was called uh fantasy headquarters and uh i still remember the guy who worked there his name was scott uh, i think the guy who owned the place was his dad and um these guys man you know, they were they were just so open and so just amazing. That's great. And uh, they didn't care who you were or how much or how little you knew. So I went in there, you know, being like 12 or 13, thinking that, you know, I kind of know everything, <laughs> you know, even though I don't, you know. And they were great. They were great, and I'll never forget them as long well, as Well, it's funny because, like, some comic book stores are, are like that. They're just like the, the people behind the behind the counter are like, like they just want to share the stuff that they love with you. Um, and when they, when you have people like that, it's fantastic. Uh, I know, I know there are some people who have bad experiences where there's kind of like a, a sense of a, a gatekeeping going on. Like, well, if you don't know this about the X-Men, then you really can't read the X-Men or whatever. Um, and I know that happens and that that's, I always find that kind of sad because like that would turn me off from wanting to read a comic, you know, like, or or even go go back to a place so it's kind of a shame when you when you when you hear about that but like the good comic book stores the things that's always good about them is that the people are i mean part of it is they want to sell you books but <laughs> it's also you see the excitement in their eyes when they're telling you about them you know uh and and how, yeah, it's the best. you know and now, I remember I remember when I first got into the comic book business I was there was a comic book store that was like a couple of towns away uh, and I would stop in there every once in a while. And they kind of knew that I was, they knew that I was at least trying to get into the business and we would just spend hours talking about every comic book on the rack and just like, literally like, what'd you think of this one? Oh, you know, and I think some of the other people that were there were also like tangentially in the business and, you know, they were in, in comics and, and stuff like that. So there was kind of this neat, like, kind of getting a gauge on what was working or what wasn't working, what people liked, what they didn't like. But, you know, uh, it was, it was really nice because there was a community that like, 
you know, uh, you don't always get in in other other hobbies or other things. Like gaming is the only other place that I've seen a a, a um, kind of a, a what do you call it? Well, I shouldn't say the only place. I think cosplay has it too now, but gaming was the only other place that had that kind of like group mentality of people kind of like leading you in and kind of saying, Oh yeah, you should try this and you should try that. And you know, you know what I mean? Like you don't normally see that in non geek yeah. culture, that kind of, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, what I love about the comics fandom is that just that, you know, from the bottom level, you know, the kid who's just walking into the comic store for the first time today uh, to the seasoned pro, um, just the whole culture at least in the main fandom, is very open and extremely inclusive. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. I love that. And the game, and what I what I love is that uh, I I I hate to say it, I'm biased. I think the gaming culture is even more so. The role playing games and card games. I believe it. And because and I think the difference is that you know comics is all about reading, so you don't really you can't read with other people. But gaming, you have to be with other people. And like, so I'll go to Gen Con and I have like the best time at Gen Con every year. I, I'm actually, I, I have to tell them this year, I'm not going to go because of the whole pandemic. And I'm like literally waiting till the last minute because I don't want to say no, because I absolutely love that show. And and I, like all the people that show up, it's just like, so full of like positive energy and everyone's there just to have fun. And it goes on. It's literally 24 hours a day for five days. Um, it's like literally nonstop. It, it's, it's insane and it's wonderful. Um, so I think the gaming world has that, that same kind of, if not more of that intense, like, come on, let's do this together kind of thing, you know? Um, which I, I just I just really love. Nice. Well, Steve, I, I don't want to keep you oh. for too long. Um, <laughs> are, are you ready for the uh, the, the closing questions sure. at the end of the sure. show? Awesome. Um, I do not have a name for this segment. I have none of the names I came up with. You know, worked. But, uh, <laughs> okay. So, so this is the, the closing section that is as of yet unnamed. Okay, here we go. Um, so what's your favorite food? <laughs> what's my favorite food? Wow. Yeah. Uh, man, that's hard. Well, okay, I, I think I know what I have to answer because if I don't answer this, people will probably laugh at, make fun of me, is potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> any any form of potato oh. <laughs> oh that's a genius pretty much you could do anything to a potato and i'll probably have i'll probably eat it like uh yeah as embarrassing as that is i mean because like there's all kinds of amazing food out there and i could say oh well i love you know foie gras or whatever but when it comes down to it like comfort food, whatever, like mashed potatoes or a baked potato or whatever. <laughs> it sounds so ridiculous but it, and so basic, but it's true. Because uh, you could do anything with a potato. <laughs> you know, I think you're the second person to say that. I interviewed somebody the other day who said potatoes. Really? I think it's just a genius answer. Have you heard any, have you heard any like really weird ones that like, you're like, what? Or, or, or. Yeah. Or, you're, or you're trying too hard. <laughs> What's that stuff that they eat in, in England? Marmite. Oh, marmite? Somebody said they like marmite on toast. Yeah. Okay, but that is that their favorite food? Yeah, it's kind of that's kind of amazing to me because I've had that and I don't know. <laughs> I think you have to you have to be I don't know. you have to be born British to understand that stuff. Yeah. I have a friend who's I, I do not understand. I have that. a very close friend who's British and she has marmite and she's like oh would you like some marmite on toast and i'm like no no that's all right that's really really <laughs> okay because it's not that it tastes bad so much as it just tastes weird i, I don't get it yeah it's like speaking a different it's language boring. or something but food <laughs> uh, 
And that that's my feel on it. It's just a completely foreign thing. I, I don't get it. Yeah, and I've eaten much more obscure foreign food that tasted more like food than Marmite. This is true. This is very like true. I've eaten some like weird falafel. creatures. I am so yeah, dumb. Marmite is not does not qualify as food. <laughs> <laughs> So would you say you're a, uh, a cat person or a dog person? Uh, I have had both cats and dogs, and I unfortunately have to, unfortunately for my wife, I have to land on dogs, but only because I we had these two cats that decided to have a pissing contest all throughout our house when we had a baby. And, oh, no. and you know, so you're already stressed out because you're taking care of a baby. And then everywhere you go, it smells like cat pee. And so ever since then, I'm like, I don't want a cat because I never want to deal with that. Again. So, so it's, 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 I loved our cats to death, but, uh, but I think if I had a choice, I would go dog, which is sad. It's and funny. I have a greyhound now, so and and she's awesome. She's kind of like a cat dog. Greyhounds are amazing. They're, they're great. They, they are, and and they're like we had a whippet before her, which are which is kind of like a greyhound but small, and they're literally like cat dogs because they 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 would love to be able to sit in your lap and just curl up, but they're too big, you know. Like <laughs> they just want to be a they want to be a lap cat and snuggle with you, but they're too big, so. They're very cute. So what's the best swear word? What's the best swear word? Oh, man. <sighs> the best swear word. Well, I... Okay, being... I make up all kinds of swear words. And I steal a lot of swear words from, like, guys like Grandpa Simpson. So... <laughs> <laughs> so they're not really swear words. They're things like, you know, concern it! So I, I, my kids... <laughs> laugh at me because like i mean they've heard me actually swear but i think i like things that sound like you know like you're having a fit when you say them as opposed to real swear yes. words like you know the more syllables and the more ridiculous so like you know concern it or dag nabbit or whatever i just love those i mean you know i could say i could say fuck because that's like the classic swear word that everybody uses and i i i, I once heard uh i once heard two people in Brooklyn have a conversation where they used the, they used fuck as every single uh, form of speech that you could possibly <laughs> use in the English language. <laughs> and, and so like, it's, it's a very versatile word, but, but like, I love things like I, there's one word I'm flanking on, but it's like a ridiculous. Uh, I think my daughter says it. it's like gall dang it or something. And it's just like, it makes no sense at all. And I just love it. You know, like, because it's so stupid, but I say all kinds of really stupid things all the time. So uh, when I, you know, I might, I might be, be I, I might be misquoting him, but I think Tom Brevoort said his favorite swear word was uh, "fiddlesticks." Fiddlesticks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought that was creative. That's a classic. I love that one. I don't think I've ever said it. Boulder Dash. Like Somebody said this. It was Tom either said Boulder Dash or fiddlesticks. <laughs> I'm gonna look it up now. I'm sorry. Well, one of them said fiddlesticks. I swear. Well, I mean, I, 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 I love the, I love the fake words that aren't real words, like cromulent, like from The Simpsons. That's a good one. And so, so like all those fake swear words are great. Like those, and, and the old ones, you know, that were like they're clearly trying to say, say something they aren't supposed to say, <laughs> and they're they're uh, unfortunately okay. Unfortunately, there's a Bill Cosby routine. That I absolutely love, and unfortunately, it's Bill Cosby, so I feel like it's been ruined forever. Um, yeah. But he did a whole thing about how he thought his dad was an idiot because when because his dad would walk in the room and just start like making faces and saying these indecipherable words because he couldn't swear in front of his kids, so he would just like flip out, but then say these things like you know, like that, and you know. I don't know, but I always I always think about that because that's what I'm like, and you know, <laughs> or at least when they were little. Now I'm not as worried about it. <laughs> nice. So what inspires you? Uh, ooh, that's a tough one because there's a lot of things. Um, 
Well, okay. There's a lot of weird things like the, like, like, but it's all, like store. Okay. So stories and coming up with stories, like just, I kind of live, eat and breathe stories. Like I have thoughts about stories all the time uh, when I'm not stressed out about jobs, but generally I wake up with like ideas for stories or adding on to stories and stuff like that. So just the idea of working kind of, what do you call it? Like toying with a, with a story or a character in my head over days and days. And then, but, but I think a lot of it too is, um, I get a lot of inspiration strangely from like, I think if, okay, this is a really hard one because I'm a weird guy because like the art I do, I tend to vacillate between fantasy art and comic art. And that means I vacillate from doing like fully rendered paintings in acrylic or watercolor to doing, you know, pen and ink drawings for comics. And so when I'm sitting down to paint, the paint is inspiring, just watching it go down and watching it, like putting it down and the, the flow of the way the paint works. But if I'm inking, when I have a brush and I'm inking with a brush and like the lines are going just where I want them to go, like that's inspiring. And just like to get up, to be able to do that, just do that is exciting and inspiring just to like make the lines. Um, and they, they can, you know, like just by doing the, the simple drawings and the lines, they can inspire stories and ideas. So I guess like I'm, I've been very, very lucky to kind of live in, uh, live in my own insanity. Like I've never, like, like even when I've worked for other people, I've kind of always been in my own creative head. So, which can be bad too, but, but so I'm always like, I'm inspired by watching other people, uh, by, you know, uh, by seeing other, uh, a lot of other artists work inspires, inspires me a lot. Like basically it's hard for me to find something that doesn't inspire me. Probably bad architecture doesn't inspire me. Um, like boring, like, <laughs> like driving around the countryside and seeing boring little ranch homes is like drains the life out of me. But like going to cities is inspiring. Um, other and 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 talking with artists and talking with friends and smart people. Smart people inspire me. Like I have I have a friend who's a a uh, 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 he's a, um, a, a a scientist who works on um, insects. What is that called? An entomologist. And he like a few years ago was working on butterfly DNA. And he altered butterfly DNA to make uh, black and silver butterflies. Wow. Yeah, and he and he so he was quoted in the Atlantic, the the magazine, the Atlantic, as saying he's like he's like yeah, it's kind of the most metal butterfly ever. And I was like, dude, that's like <laughs> the coolest thing. And he's not, you know, he's not like I mean he he's this guy. He's a scientist, and he owns Mobius prints, and he has on hang on his walls. So like, I think, um, you know, I just, I, I like everything that people make and I like nature. I don't know. It's hard for me. Like I said, it's hard for me to, uh, my, my problem is not, is going somewhere and not wanting to pull out my sketchbook and try and work, which has always been a struggle with like, like uh, when, when you're supposed to be responsible for other people and children and things like that not being able not yeah. being able to break out your sketchbook at a moment's notice and just start drawing all the time uh is very hard and that's something that that I struggle with because I have to I have to tone myself back from doing that because oh wait there's other responsibilities but like basically if I had my way I would just be drawing all the time or painting or or sculpting or like basically making like I think making stories making anything is just so inspiring that it makes you want to make more <laughs> um, yeah and i know that sounds like ridiculous but it's true it's like a it's like addict it's like an addiction you know i, I could see how, that, how it would work that way so what brings you joy <laughs> uh 
I think I kind of just described that. But uh, well, okay. I mean, there's, yeah, you sort of there's kind of the regular things like like my kids are pretty awesome, and uh, and my dog and my wife are all pretty awesome. Uh, but I think when it's like things that that bring me joy are like when I can like when I read a book or a comic or I see a movie that surprises me but does it really well. Um. I really like that, I, and, I, and, I, and meaning like they have to surprise me. Meaning like they have to do something that I didn't ex- like, I didn't expect, uh, and so that you know that kind of a thing. But I think I mean honestly, if I'm going to be totally perfectly honest, just making art is making art with friends is probably the thing that I enjoy the most. Like having friends around, like. We, I have some friends who come over and we sit around and we drink and we, we draw and like, we just hang out and talk about art and talk about whatever, talk about life, whatever. And we just doodle and draw and, and they're tattoo artists. They're not comic artists. Um, but I've had friends who are painters and, and currently the people who are nearby are tattoo artists, but like just being able to go and hang out with other people and draw, like if I didn't have to do it, for work and I could just hang out with my friends and drink coffee and booze and draw all the time. That would be, that would be joy. Like that is, that is it. Like (laughs) talking to other people and drawing like, (laughs) yeah, that's kind of a weird thing, but. No, it's not weird. It's perfectly reasonable, you know? So you've got one big world saving altruistic wish. What is it? World saving altruistic wish. Uh, wow. It's like that, that Miss America question, right? <laughs> How would you save the world? It sort of is. Yeah. So, uh, it, honestly, I think it would be empathy if everyone had empathy. That would, that would, I think. That would be the thing, because if everyone had more empathy or empathy at all, I think we'd have an incredibly different place we live in. It's in short supply these days, for sure. Well, I think it's out there. I think it's just the people who don't have it are very loud. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think if, if if you know, if we all could have more of it, it would be. We might just have a planet of people sitting around crying too. I don't know, but <laughs> you know, but 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 the, you know, the 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 flip side is, I just I just feel like it would it would solve a lot of the a lot of the problems because it's not that easy to when you empathize with someone, it's not that easy to just dis uh, what do you call it disregard their disassociate yeah or disassociate yeah or disregard them right. So if you if you you can't disregard someone you empathize with, or you can't disassociate from someone you empathize with. So suddenly you'd have to do something about it. And so people would be doing something about it, you know? So I think that's sure. probably the only, yeah, that's probably the, the one blanket thing I could say. <laughs> okay, so you wake up one morning and you are imbued with superpowers. Um, what are those powers and what do you choose to do with them? Oh, um... Okay, let's see. I wake up with morning with superpowers, and what do I choose to do with them? Um, well, now, do I have to be altruistic, or can I just be... <laughs> um, well, that's the next question, actually. Oh, oh, the next question is, do I have to be altruistic with them? Um, okay, well... Well, the next question is, you know, or do you see yourself as a as a hero or a villain or an anti-hero, maybe somebody who isn't heroic. Oh, I don't know. That's weird. Okay. So now I have to think about that too. Well, the, the thing about the, the superpower, um, man, I can think of so many ridiculous ones. See, I, I used to have this game called Superpowers that some friends of mine and I created. It was a role-playing game. Um, and called superpowers, sorry, not superpower. And basically it was basically, you had all these really, really ridiculously bad, stupid superpowers. 
and <laughs> one it. of them, and, and you and you, you still had to salt, you still had to save the world, right? So one of them was uh, give wedgies mentally, um, so like psychic wedgies, uh, and I just think that would be really funny. Um, but and there's a lot of really funny ones in there. But I don't know, like if you know, like oh well, you know, I could like man you could be all like mushy about it. <laughs> I'm like, how do I do? What do I say? Um, I'm probably thinking way too hard now, aren't I? Um, it's fine. I guess to, okay, to be able to have control over, like have a, what do you call it? Like a time, like a time travel thing, like where you can, where you could, you could experience the same moment in different places at the same time. So you never miss out on something. So like if you wanted to be at a convention in New York, but you also wanted to hang out with your friend, you could do both. And you'd remember both. And you'd be fully in both places. <laughs> That'd be kind of cool. I don't know. That's 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 the one I can think of. So you never miss out. Like I know it sounds ridiculous, but yeah, you never you never miss any of the the cool things you want to do or the good things you want to do. So I think that'd be a cool one to have. So I guess, yeah, I would I would I would then be able to do, you know, I don't know. I just feel like you, you would never, you would never miss out on time with someone you, you like, and you could also do other things. <laughs> it's a very selfish power. <laughs> it's a good power. I think that'd be cool. I'm not here to judge you on, on what you're <laughs> No, I know. I'm just thinking, you it's know, funny. just in general. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so 100 years from now, NASA throws your lifetime of creative output into a space capsule and launches it into deep space. What would it be? Some undetermined, oh. some undetermined uh, time later, um, somehow something happens and aliens of some kind um, find the capsule and consume your creative output. Um, What's their thought? What do they what do they think of the work? <laughs> what do they think of the work? Oh man. Man, that's hard. Uh I think the negative thing is that like this guy liked to draw a lot of people beating each other up. That would probably be the bad one. <laughs> but uh <laughs> but the um I guess the the good side would be I hope that uh that the characters were true in some way um and that the stories had a had a, had a, a a like a not truth as in they were you know real true stories but like truth as in they felt real they felt right you know what i mean and that they could that they could empathize or not empathize but they could understand the stories on a on a on a personal level, I guess. <laughs> I don't know how else to put that. I mean, to it. I don't know how else to put that, but yeah, I think that's you know. So, what's next for uh, for Steve Ellis? That's what I'm trying to figure out. No, um, well, I've been so I've been doing. I've been working on a novel. For uh, I, I started a few years ago. I started this thing called Thornclaw Manor, which was like a decks of cards of these weird little of these like this weird family of monsters and they're kind of like monsters and fairies and other creatures like that um and it was just originally it was just portraits like uh victorian style portraits and then as i did them they started to like a story started developing around them and so um i've been working on that for a while and uh and I did a couple of kickstarters based on that and I have all these decks and stuff and um and I I guess well what what's happening what's been happening lately is my uh one of my the the writing agent that I've been working with told me that I needed to write a script or not a script but write a book a novel for it and she was like she was thinking a graphic novel I'm like but I don't imagine drawing a graphic novel for this I think I'd like to write it as a book and so I've been spending my time, like when I wake up in the morning, I spend like 20 minutes a day or more 
you know, 20 minutes to an hour a day, just writing before I get started with everything else and uh, trying to put together a novel. So I think that would be the thing that's next is hopefully I get that done. Um, unfortunately, freelance tends to take my time away from that, but that's, that's the thing that I'm doing now. And, and so trying to build, build a world with interesting characters, like, a, you know, like I've been doing, but in this case, doing it myself in a way that I've never done it before. <laughs> That's exciting. Yeah, it is. And daunting. But, you know, it's one of those things where you're like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm going to write a novel. And you're like, That's a huge undertaking when you realize what you've just committed to. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like a season of Law and Order. That's, that's the way I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> An entire season of Law and Order. Wow. What was that like? Yeah, it's a lot of 800 work. episodes? <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> So, uh, so Steve, I, I wanted to thank you for uh, for for doing us the honor of uh, of being on my humble little podcast. Oh, my pleasure! It's been a lot of fun. The it really has. Where can people find you online? Okay, well, let's see. Um, pretty much, if you look up Steve Ellis Art uh, on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or steveellisart.com, you should find me. Um. And yeah, it's pretty much, I've kind of consolidated it all down to Steve Ellis art. So that should be where everything is. But then there's also like thornclawmanor.com and uh, I have a web, I have a store at Big Cartel that I think is called Steve Ellis art at bigcartel.com, <laughs> something like that. But yeah, basically that's, that's the thing. So like, uh, I kind of put it, I kind of owned, figure out how to own my name by putting art at the end. Um, so, so I end up on all the different platforms there. And that's it, my babies. It's time to close the show. I wanted to thank you for being gorgeous, being valid, and living your best life. We couldn't do this show without you. And I appreciate you. This episode has been part of Batch 35. Oh, the show's Twitter profile, at TitularPod, is under new management this week, and I wanted to mention it. The profile is being run by my friend Sparky, an actual social media goblin who lives under my bed and works for Cheese. Sparky's pronouns are they, them. Titular Characters is a show about the things we love. It's produced and hosted by the adorable Eva Webb. That's me. Opening theme by Antonia Marquis. Closing theme by Mikey Flash of Speed Force Music. The dreamy announcer guy is Donnie Underwood, and he's pretty awesome. So have you put much thought into supporting the show? There are tons of ways to do it. You can show your support by following me at Eva is Adorable on Twitter, leaving us a review at Apple Podcasts, CastBox, or Podchaser. And if you're feeling like you want to help out financially, you can visit us at Buy Me a Coffee slash Eva is Adorable. Because I am. There you can donate as little as a dollar, and all proceeds go towards the costs of producing and hosting this show. Every little bit helps. And you are amazing for even considering it. Anyway, darlings, that's all we got. Join us next time for another death-defying adventure in cyberspace. Oh, and when you do, bring candy. Love yous.